Blue Tip, a DMC production, written, illustrated, and narrated by Dustin Sandoval. I live by four principles. Trust your senses. There are no limits. Effort equals reward. Power is all. The hard part is never following your rules. It's keeping them. 1987, Sakaric, Aluzeniv. The sun hangs low over the Sentinel Gray, settling ever so slowly on Sakaric's horizon. Bathed in blankets of red and orange, the city bleeds in shades of dying daylight. My name is Danto, and I graduated from high school today. My white complexion contrasting against a sea of brown and black. I walk past the other seniors dressed in their ceremonial gowns, a full three dozen in total. Ecstatic, the academy celebrates the occasion with an outdoors barbecue on the dewy grass of its dilapidated soccer field. Not since the school's founding in the 1960s had so many students graduated at once, for in Sakaric, education was a skill rarely nurtured. Smile for me, a feminine voice behind me says in a faded nascent accent. I flinch at the camera's flash. I don't remember buying a camera. I tell her, giving her a hug. But you do remember giving me money, yes? She asks playfully, holding me tight. It was my mother, Kuna. Or at least, that's what she told me her name was. The woman was half a foot shorter than me, around 5'8". Her dark brown hair, meticulously combed, flowed in the wind. The nascent's long nose led down to her full red lips. Her kind brown eyes displayed a torrent of maternity for the boy. Seldom did caring eyes ever fall upon Danto, let alone ones with such overbearing affection. So he was lost in uncertainty, unsure on how to react to his mother's great love. Kuna wore her old wrinkled blue jeans over a white tank top adorned with Sakaric's flora. A large red flower lay on her left breast, opening to welcome spring's warm breeze. Surrounding the red daisy lip, spiky green vines representing the harsh underlying summer emerge out of the blossoming angiosperm. Lifeless falling brown leaves signal summer's end on her belly's lower left side, bringing an end to the shirt's frontal design. Her usual turquoise earrings hung from her ears, the jaggedly carved jewel glistening in the sun. She has an angular face, her pronounced cheekbones perfectly symmetrical, as is the rest of her body sculpted by years of training. Even in her near forties, the woman is a beauty, the city's men always approaching her with lustful compliments, until they got close. Even though Kuna was feminine, she was not a normal woman. Her skin was callous and sprinkled with battle scars, arms sporting lines of uneven flesh revealing her violent past. Some of her cicatrices were long and narrow, like knife entry wounds, while others formed craters telling entrances of lead spears. The most noticeable mark of all being the westward bent line of scar tissue dextral to her right eye, starting just above her brow, crossing her crow's feet, and ending on her right cheekbone. One close look at this mother's marred physique and the men ceased their advances. He felt it too, the uneasy premeditation of paranoia as others got too close to her, his apathy towards the white world always flickering between neutral to target whenever they glanced her way his mind trying to spot a thread in the great crowd of mirages. So this is what being a son is like, Danto thought, loosening his grip on his mother. She smiles as she pulls back to look at me, her eyes watery with joy. I'm very proud of you, son. Today we celebrate with our savings, she says, happiness filling her voice with crisp promise. Don't you mean my savings? I respond, my tone lighter than usual. She raises her brow and smirks, shrugging her shoulders. Tone mockingly rate, Kuna jokes. Life for a few drinks? Sounds fair to me. Her inflection overly full with politeness, seemingly trying to mask a repressed sadness. After our meal, I find myself driving through an endless road of soggy mud and pitch black darkness. The headlights of the car providing about 30 feet of visibility, laying a tapestry of yellow light on the sloppy road. I've always hated this feeling, driving through an unknown void of shadows. 
Sight is everything to me. What you see, you can control. What you can't see, controls you. Mom murmurs in her sleep, her words slurred by the high volume of alcohol in her bloodstream. Not one for restraint, the woman always drinks too much during celebrations and passes out almost every time, leaving me to drive her home. Today I don't mind though, glancing over at her sleeping figure. Laying against the truck's frame, Kuna's face is unmistakably satisfied, her muscles relaxed and wearing a soft grin. The woman seems content, truly content and not the fake personality she showboats to raise my spirits. It's something I haven't seen since she found me, all those months ago. Reaching the house around midnight, I carry her inside. Sakarik is located in northern Underland, the city totally engulfed by a ring of mountains. Politically abandoned by almost every world government, the metropolis is filled with greed and corruption, the entire landscape resembling a colossal landfill overflowing with tin shacks painted with the leaking fluids of their inhabitants' rotting corpses. The city had earned its nickname, Sangrienta. That's why we all live about eight miles from the main city, our closest neighbor being about three miles away. Here I don't have to worry too much about the gangs bothering mom. Our small house sits atop an equally small hill. Turquoise paint covers the sides, while a roof of nickel gray tiles provides shelter from the rains. Small hills covered in dying khaki grass surround the house, and further out still lies the jungle. Inside the house has four rooms, a radio, stove, sink, three wooden tables, two queen-sized beds, a coffee-colored couch, a pearly white toilet, the camouflage living room chair, and even a bath with hot water. My father left my mom the house, but I bought her all the amenities. Compared to the rest of the city, our house is a castle. I never leave mom alone for very long, except on nights like tonight. As I sit down on the couch to rest my weary legs, I hear a whistle outside the door. Bolting to the door, I stop and slowly open the wooden entryway. Stepping outside, I look around. Nothing. It's all quiet. The only sound coming from the wind raking against the long blades of dead grass. However, beside a small rainbow leaf bush on the right side of the house, I spot the glint of metal. Walking over to the conspicuous object, I glance down. A blue toy wagon sits still beneath me, its steel edges reflecting the moonlight. A single folded piece of paper lies inside it, weighed down by a green daub stone. I pick up the letter and unfold it, scanning over its contents. The letter has the location, description, name, and picture of a man. The man I am to kill. This is my first loan assignment with the Underworld. They want to know how good I am, and to tell the truth, so do I. Opening the right back door of my Sea Green 1981 Telerev D30, I unhook a metal lock under the right back seat. The entire covering underneath the seat opens and I take out my right hand man. Time to work. I say, smiling, as I load my custom anti-material sniper rifle, version 6. 